The Origin of Capitalism, A Longer View, by Ellen Mason's Wood. Introduction. The collapse of communism in the late 1980s and 1990s seemed to confirm what many people have long believed, that capitalism is the natural condition of humanity, that it conforms to the laws of nature and basic human inclinations, and that any deviation for the, from those natural laws and inclinations can only come to grief. There are, of course, many reasons today for questioning the capitalist triumphalism that followed in the wake of the collapse. While I was writing the introduction to the first edition of this book, the world was still reeling from the Asian crisis. Today, the financial pages of the daily press are nervously watching the signs of recession in the United States and rediscovering the old capitalist cycles that they had been assuring us were a thing of the past. The period between these two episodes has been punctuated in various parts of the world by a series of dramatic demonstrations that profoundly describe themselves as anti-capitalist. And while many participants seem inclined to dissociate the evils of, evils of globalization or neoliberalism from the essential and irreducible nature of capitalism itself, they are very clear about the conflict between the needs of people and the requirements of profit, as manifested in everything from the growing gap between rich and poor to the increasing ecological destruction. In the past, capitalism has always pulled out of the, its recurrent crises, but never without laying a foundation for new and even worse ones. Whatever means have been found to limit or correct the damage, as many millions of people have often suffered from the cure as from the disease, for as many millions of people have often suffered from the cure as from the disease. The increasingly transparent weaknesses and contradictions in the capitalist system may eventually convince even some of its more uncritical supporters that an alternative needs to be found, but the conviction that there is and can be no alternative is very deeply rooted, especially in Western culture. That conviction is supported not only by the more blatant expressions of capitalist ideology, but also by some of our most cherished and unquestioned beliefs about history. Not just the history of capitalism, but history in general. It is as if capitalism has always been the destination of historical movement. And more than that, the movement of history itself has from the beginning been driven by capitalist laws of motion. Begging the question. Capitalism is a system in which goods and services, down to the most basic necessities of life, are produced for profitable exchange, where even human labor power is a commodity for sale in the market, and where all economic actors are dependent on the market. This is true not only of workers who must sell their labor power for a wage, but also of capitalists who depend on the market to buy their inputs, including labor power, and to sell their output for profit. Capitalism differs from other social forms because producers depend on the market for access to the means of production, unlike, for instance, peasants who remain in direct, non-market possession of land. While appropriators cannot rely on extra economic powers of appropriation, by means of direct coercion, such as the military, political, and judicial powers that enable feudal lords to extract surplus labor from peasants, 
but must depend on the purely economic mechanisms of the market. This distinct system of market dependence means that the requirements of competition and profit maximization are the fundamental rules of life. Because of those rules, capitalism is a system uniquely driven to improve the productivity of labor by technical means. Above all, it is a system in which the bulk of society's work is done by propertyless laborers who are obliged to sell their labor power in exchange for a wage in order to gain access to the means of life and of labor itself. In the process of supplying the needs and wants of society, workers are at the same time and inseparably creating profits for those who buy their labor power. In fact, the production of goods and services is subordinate to the production of capital and capitalist profit. The basic objective of the capitalist system, in other words, is the production and self-expansion of capital. This distinctive way of supplying the material needs of human beings, so very different from all preceding ways of organizing material life and social reproduction, has existed for a very short time, barely a fraction of humanity's existence on Earth. Even those who most emphatically insist on the system's roots in human nature and its natural continuity with age-old human practices would not claim that it really existed before the early modern period and then only in Western Europe. They may see bits of it in earlier periods or detect its beginning in the Middle Ages as a looming threat to a declining feudalism but still constrained by feudal restrictions, or they may say that it began with the expansion of trade or the voyages of discovery with, say, Columbus's explorations at the end of the 15th century. Some might call these early forms proto-capitalism, but few would say that the capitalist system existed in earnest before the 16th or 17th century and some would place it as late as the 18th, or perhaps even the 19th, when it matured into its industrial form. Yet, paradoxically, historical accounts of how this system came into being have typically treated it as the natural realization of ever-present tendencies. Since historians first began explaining the emergence of capitalism, there has scarcely existed an explanation that did not begin by assuming the very thing that needed to be explained. Almost without exception, accounts of the origin of capitalism have been fundamentally circular. They have assumed the prior existence of capitalism in order to explain capitalism's coming into being. In order to explain capitalism's distinctive drive to maximize profit, they have presupposed the existence of a universal profit-maximizing rationality. In order to explain capitalism's drive to improve labor productivity by technical means, they have also presupposed a continuous, almost natural progress of technological improvement in the productivity of labor. These question-begging explanations have their origins in classical political economy and Enlightenment conceptions of progress. Together they give an account of historical development in which the emergence and growth to maturity of capitalism are already prefigured in the earliest manifestations of human rationality, in the technological advances that began with Homo when Homo sapiens first wielded a tool, and in the acts of exchange human beings have practiced since time immemorial. History's journey to that final destination, to commercial society, or capitalism, has to be sure, been long and arduous, and many obstacles have stood in its way. 
but its progress has nonetheless been natural and inevitable. Nothing more is required, then, to explain the rise of capitalism than an account of how the many obstacles to capitalism's forward movement have been lifted, sometimes gradually, sometimes suddenly, with revolutionary violence. In most accounts of capitalism and its origin, there really is no origin. Capitalism seems to always be there, somewhere, and it only needs to be released from its chains, for instance, from the fetters of feudalism, to be allowed to grow and mature. Typically, these fetters are political. The parasitic powers of lordship or the restrictions of an autocratic state. Sometimes they are cultural or ideological, perhaps the wrong religion. These constraints confine the free movement of, quote, economic actors, the free expression of economic rationality. The, quote, economic in these formulations is identified with exchange or markets. And it is here that we can detect the assumption that the seeds of capitalism are contained in the most primitive acts of exchange in any form of trade or market activity. That assumption is typically connected with other presuppos the other presupposition, that history has been an almost natural process of technological development. One way or another, capitalism more or less naturally appears when and where expanding markets and technological development reach the right level, allowing sufficient wealth to be accumulated so that it can be profitably reinvested. Many Marxist explanations are fundamentally the same, with the addition of bourgeois revolutions to help break the fetters. The effect of these explanations is to stress the continuity between non-capitalist and capitalist societies and to deny or distinguish the specificity or oh, excuse me, me read that whole sentence the effect of these explanations is to stress the continuity between non-capitalist and capitalist societies and to deny or disguise the specificity of capitalism. Exchange has existed more or less forever, and it seems that the capitalist market is just more of the same. In this kind of argument, because capitalism's specific and unique need constantly to revolutionize the forces of production is just an extension and an acceleration of universal and transhistorical almost natural tendencies. Industrialization is the inevitable outcome of humanity's most basic inclinations. So the lineage of capitalism passes naturally from the earliest Babylonian merchant through the medieval Burr to the early modern bourgeois and finally to the industrial capitalist. There's a similar logic in certain Marxist versions of this story, even though the narrative in more recent versions often shifts from the town to the countryside, and merchants are replaced by rural commodity producers, small or middling farmers, waiting for the opportunity to blossom into full-blown capitalists. In this kind of narrative, petty commodity production, released from the bonds of feudalism, grows more or less naturally into capitalism. And the petty commodity producers, just given the chance, will take the capitalist road. Central to these conventional accounts of history are certain assumptions, explicit or implicit, about human nature and about how human beings will behave if only given the chance. They will, so the story goes, always avail themselves of the opportunity to maximize profit through acts of exchange. And in order to realize that natural inclination, 
they will always find ways of improving the organization and instruments of work in order to enhance the productivity of labor. Opportunity or imperative. In the classic model, then, capitalism is an opportunity to be taken wherever and whenever possible. This notion of opportunity is absolutely critical to the conventional understanding of the capitalist system, present even in our everyday language. Consider common usage of the word that lies at the very heart of capitalism, the market. Almost every definition of market in the dictionary connotes an opportunity. As a concrete locale or institution, a market is a place where opportunities exist to buy and sell. As an abstraction, a market is the possibility of sale. Goods, quote, find a market. And we say there is a market for a service or commodity when there is a demand for a commodity or service, which means it can and will be sold. Markets are, quote, opened to those who want to sell. The market represents, quote, conditions as regards opportunity for buying and selling, end quote. The concise Oxford Dictionary. The market implies offering and choice. What then are market forces? Doesn't force imply coercion? In capitalist ideology, the market implies not only compulsion, but freedom. Mm, excuse me. In capitalism, in capital, <laughs> in capital, I'm trying to read like a pompous ass, and this is what I get. <laughs> in capitalist ideology, the market implies not compulsion, but freedom. At the same time, this freedom is guaranteed by certain mechanisms that ensure a quote rational economy. Where supply meet do that I'm fucking up. I'm gonna kill myself. Don't tell anybody. What then are market forces? Doesn't force imply coercion? In capitalist ideology, the market implies not compulsion, but freedom. At the same time, this freedom is guaranteed by certain mechanisms that ensure a, quote, rational economy, where supplies meet demand, putting on offer commodities and services that people will freely choose. These mechanisms are the impersonal forces of the market, and if they are in any way coercive, it is simply in the sense that they compel economic actors to act, quote, rationally so as to maximize choice and opportunity. This implies that capitalism, the ultimate, quote, market society, is the optimal condition of opportunity and choice. More goods and services are on offer, more people are more free to sell and profit from them, and more people are more free to choose among and buy them. So what is wrong with this conception? A socialist is likely to say that the major missing ingredient is the commodification of labor power and class exploitation. So far, so good. But what may not always be so clear, even in socialist accounts of the market, is that the distinctive and dominant characteristic of the capitalist market is not opportunity or choice, but, on the contrary, compulsion. Material life and social reproduction in capitalism 
are universally mediated by the market so that all individuals must in one way or another enter into market relations in order to gain access to the means of life. This unique system of market dependence means that the dictates of the capitalist market, the capitalist market's imperatives of competition, accumulation, profit maximization, and increasing labor productivity regulate not only all economic transactions, but social relations in general. As relations among human beings are mediated by the process of commodity exchange, social relations among people appear as relations among things. The fetishism of commodities in Marx's famous phrase. Some readers are likely to object that there is <clears throat> some readers are likely to object here that this is something every socialist or at least every Marxist knows. But as we shall see in what follows, the specificates the specificities of capitalism, like the operation of the capitalist market, as imperative rather than as opportunity, tend to get lost even in Marxist histories of capitalism. The capitalist market, as a specific social form, disappears when the transition from pre-capitalist to capitalist societies is presented as a more or less natural, if often thwarted, extension or maturation of already existing social forms, at best a quantitative rather than a qualitative transformation. This book is about the origin of capitalism and about the controversies it has evoked, both historical and theoretical. Part 1 surveys the most important historical accounts and the debates surrounding them. It deals in particular with the most common model of capitalist development, the so-called, quote, commercialization model. In several of its variants, and also with some of the main challenges to it. Parts 2 and 3 sketch an alternative history that I hope avoids some of the most common pitfalls of the standard question-begging explanations. Building on the debates discussed in Part 1, and especially on those histories that have challenged the prevailing conventions, this new, revised and expanded edition contains, among other things, new sections and chapters in which arguments are developed that were only hinted at in the first edition, especially about non-capitalist commerce, the origin of capitalist imperialism, and the relation between capitalism and the nation-state. I have added a subtitle to the original title, which I hope will convey not only the simple fact that this new edition is substantially longer than the old edition, but also the fact that I am taking what might be called a, quote, long view of capitalism and its consequences. My first intention is to challenge the naturalization of capitalism and to highlight the particular ways in which capitalism represents a historically specific social form and a historic rupture with earlier forms. But the purpose of this exercise is both scholarly and political. The naturalization of capitalism, which denies capitalism's specificity and the long and painful historical processes that brought capitalism into being, limits our understanding of the past. At the same time, it restricts our hopes and expectations for the future. For if capitalism is the natural culmination of history, then surmounting capitalism is unimaginable. The question of the origin of capitalism may seem arcane, but it goes to the heart of assumptions deeply rooted in our culture, widespread and dangerous illusions about the so-called free market, 
and its benefits to humanity, its compatibility with democracy, social justice, and ecological sustainability. Thinking about future alternatives to capitalism requires us to think about alternative conceptions of its past. All right.